Ideas in STEM Ed is a production of the Idea Engineering Student Center at UC San Diego, which works to promote community, success, and inclusion at all levels. My name is Darren Lapomi, Professor of Nanoengineering and Chemical Engineering and Faculty Director of the Idea Center. The purpose of this podcast is to provide a forum for the discussion of innovative and inclusive approaches to teaching and mentoring, and to support the personal and academic flourishing and success of students in science and engineering. To learn more about the Idea Center, visit jacobschool.ucsd.edu front slash idea. Rachel Burks is an Associate Professor of Analytical Chemistry at American University in Washington, D.C. She became interested in chemistry when she visited the FBI crime lab on a middle school trip to Washington, D.C. After going to grad school, she worked as a forensic scientist in a crime lab before returning to academia, first at St. Edwards University in Austin, Texas, and later to her current position at American University. Her lab focuses on analytical techniques which use colorimetric and luminescent assays using handheld tools such as cell phones as instruments in the field. In addition to her scientific work, Rachelle is a prolific scientific communicator with frequent appearances on podcasts and with a regular column on true crime stories in Chemistry World magazine. She is a 2020 recipient of the James T. Grady and James H. Stack Award for Interpreting Chemistry for the Public from the American Chemical Society. It's enough to say that previous awardees include Alan Alda. Uh, Rachel is also an advocate for women and people of color in STEM fields, and it is my pleasure to welcome her today. Thank you. So, I heard uh, from a previous appearance on another podcast that uh, <laughs> that you uh, became interested in forensic science when you visited an FBI crime lab. But I also got the impression that your interest was primed up with with crime TV, uh, like Who Done It shows, like Matlock, Columbo, and Murder She Wrote. Is that accurate? And can you tell us a little bit about that? It's definitely accurate. Um, I watched, you know, TV with my grandparents um, and my parents. And even before, say, forensic caught my eye kind of in junior high, I was really interested in crime (laughs) and and kind of the law and detective, you know, kind of that whole genre. Uh, And so, yes, Murder, She Wrote, any of the, quote, kind of cozy mystery, if that's mm-hmm. a whole genre. Uh, I had never heard so, that term before. Yes, that's- <laughs> so just, you know, just, you know, by the fire and you're like, oh, look, an English house party. Someone's going to die. <laughs> like, <laughs> there's this whole genre and somehow, you know, like the Agatha Christie, right? That whole kind of Father Brown. Um, there's this whole kind of genre, which is, yes, it's a crime drama. But for some reason, it feels like, oh, let's all settle in. And, and just bond together while we solve this mystery. <laughs> yeah. And, and I get such a feeling of warmth whenever I hear the murder, the opening piano theme. You to the murder, murder right? show. Um, I remember <laughs> watching those shows with my, my family. Um, I even remember taking stuffed animals with my sister and acting out scenes. And yes. we had a, we had a rainbow bright doll, the one with the green hair that uh, we named Ikaka sweatshirt um, as <laughs> to rhyme with Jessica Fletcher. And we played out the whole theme. I had another show where I had uh, Packy the Penguin who played Pen Patlock. And we, we just, we did the whole thing uh, as like a puppet show in our, in the bedroom. <laughs> so I- it is. It, they, These were family shows. And I think yep. that- you know, it's and I still if we can agree in my family to watch anything, it's like, OK, some cooking shows, murder, she wrote like there's like a very, you know, and it seems like one of those things where it's like we can agree on this. Right. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, And so that was really nice, but it really got me thinking because it occupies the mind, even when that some, you know, some of them are quite obvious clues and some of them the kind of the fun ones where you know who did it before the big reveal, like where they're like, I've brought you all together to tell you the murderer, right? <laughs> like, you know who it is, um, but mm-hmm. still like putting everything together and like, how are they going to wrap this up in the 42 minutes with television breaks um, is still 
really great and like what the clues are going to be. Uh, and so, I mean, now I realize that, and maybe I'll write a book on this someday if someone hasn't already <laughs> is murder. She wrote specifically really kind of straddles this huge growth area in forensic science, where if you watch the beginning episodes, it's kind of, you know, the stuff that, you know, blood typing, uh, you know, latent prints uh, or fingerprint analysis and like lots of trace evidence and footwear and all this stuff. And then you can see when forensic DNA typing is introduced because the season after, right? Like they're really keeping up with the times and mm-hmm. it becomes like this whole kind of modern forensic angle, which is kind of fun. Um, and Columbo, of course, watching Columbo is just like, this is wild, you know, <laughs> it's still, a good, still a good story. Right. Yeah. And uh, so the, the technology evolved along with these TV shows. And this is maybe a garden path. But so most DNA, I, I think people think that DNA testing in a in a forensic analysis has something to do with sequencing, but it doesn't. Right. It's it's uh, short tandem repeats. And do um Does sequencing ever play a role in forensics now that it's cheaper to do so? I I do think there's some research out there, Um, but I I, I do think you're right. I think that, you know, most people for, you know, for many reasons, because of how potentially it's communicated, um, is that when, when you say or forensic genetics or certain things, they're thinking that they're doing an entire sequence, right? A human genome sequence. I don't know. Right. Like. Um, United States anyway, it's a certain number of loci and quote the non-coding, um, mm-hmm. which that name's kind of stuck around uh, yeah. in, in that region. And it, it has to be very formulaic like that because you're going to enter databases and have areas of comparison. So it couldn't be the whole sequence. Like just from a, a data comparison option, man, that would be massive, right? Mm-hmm. To, to, to do that. Um, and so when people say, oh, they're going to have information, I mean, the, the general consensus are these, this is not, and that's even kind of an, an asterisk of this is not revealing genetic information where it's not like, you know, certain components, but then you have technologies now, and com- pri- usually private companies who will say that they can build you, you know, a, a visual representation of this person. So they're not using low side data. They're, right. they're, that's a completely different thing where they are, in fact, looking at, you know, genetic information that would give an idea, say for myself, that I would have freckles, brown eyes, um, you know, and, and a certain level of skin tone. Um, mm-hmm. That's not what your standard, you know, forensic analysis is going to do. It's a very set regimented little snippets, like you said. And so really depends. And of course, you add on to that. And, and I think you're in California. Is that mm-hmm. my home state? Yeah, uh, UCSD. So you, <laughs> you add on to that some of the high profile work that's been done from, say, um, available databases like a 23andMe. And I'm not saying it's that company. Other ones where people are submitting profiles to find familiar matches or potentially caught out the person who left that that signature uh, and and try to match it up that way. You know, examples of Golden State Killer, quote unquote, uh, mm-hmm. would be one example of that. And and I think that kind of technology and those types of ramp up. And I do want to make clear, I'm not a forensic geneticist. Um, I try to stay up to date on the field. There's a lot of research in this area, and there's also a lot of considerations about ethical, legal ramifications of every avenue. Of, of forensic um, kind of exploration and privacy issues and, and all of that. And so I think what always interests and what continues to interest me about forensic sciences and forensic chemistry is that this is at the intersection of so many things, right? I often say, and I've said this a couple of times recently is chemistry is the study of, of matter and crime how we define it, how we punish it, how we mitigate it, you know, who we define as criminals, who we prosecute, who we don't, tells us who and what we think matters. And at that intersection, 
I am just continuously concerned and fascinated and terrified and all of these things. So it kind of makes sense that I would try to work in this area where, and I think there are a lot of, you know, the health, climate change, there are areas where you're, you're, it's not just, just science. You are at the intersection of society, of policy, of, you know, these, these greater forces, if you will, that control even the scientific questions that get asked and the data and how it gets analyzed and what we use it for. And that is what really continues to fascinate and concern me as I, as I think it should Mm -hmm. (laughs) everyone (laughs) that works in these areas. Sure. And your technical area has also led you to sort of a, I don't know if it's a, a second career or a coextensive career in science writing. First, I, I have to, I, I do want to go there, but I do have to ask the question, is it possible for someone like you to enjoy CSI or a show like that, knowing what you know about forensic analysis? You know, it is. And I will say my favorite CSI and and these shows are why they're entertainment on purpose and 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 not that they're they play fast right I'm sure a physicist watching I know I know a, a particular physicist who would watch Fast and the Furious and be like I need to just go lay down like all the laws of physics don't you know everyone does <laughs> but they love it right because it's it's fun right and the, it's the the just the the sheer audacity of it sometimes and my favorite csi because it was so wild in my opinion oh i do love me some csi miami i just love the breaks of like sunglasses and then just why you know, just <laughs> and the, it just is just, just random you know the personalities um but sure i watch maybe you do this too with your field is i watch these things with two minds and they don't compete in fact I kind of like it where I have the mind of a a super fan of, of genre. And then I have the mind of like, maybe like those Muppets and uh, the old Muppets that are up in the balcony that are just like, no, (laughs) (laughs) the old Statler and Waldorf. (laughs) Yes. And that's actually fun. And I don't see them as like competing because I can absolutely be like, love it, hysterical, funny, fast pack, whatever. They'd all be dead. And this would have been over within the first two minutes. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, yes, I could I, I, can, I see that a- as being both. So tell me about how you got into scientific writing. Did you have particular books that you read uh, growing up or was it, did it, was it born out of sort of the inter- intersection of forensic science with justice and, um, and your interest in history? How did it, how did it arise? Jaws, Jaws, the movie Jaws. And I really credit now, especially as I've gotten older, I realize my roots as being someone analytical and very into investigating is really rooted in my family. But definitely my parents are huge horror fans and they made a series <laughs> of decisions, which I don't know. I'm not a parent. So who knows if these were good. <laughs> but I saw Jaws when I was about five years old. Again, not sure that was the best of calls. I watched <laughs> it with my whole family. And I mean, cousins to second, you know, we watched it in a big group. Um, and, you know, my parents' motto with, I saw Alien very young, which is my favorite chemistry movie. I saw, you know, it, I saw Romero, so I had a living dead very young. Because my parents' idea was, we can talk about it and we can work it out. It won't be as scary because then we can manage the information And again, I don't know, Uh, but when I saw Jaws, I, we, going up near the beach, I was just like, I'm never going in the water again, not getting in the pool. You can't get me in the bathtub. I'm not going in the shower. (laughs) This is a hellscape. So my parents, especially my dad, they took me to the library. We were pulling all these books, talking about it, looking in the encyclopedia and like really getting into like, this is not how sharks behave. This isn't how sharks work like the vendetta of that (laughs) and really getting into and number one, you're not going to have, you're not going to have a shark in your pool, right? The shark isn't going to come in the bathtub. Like this is why, like, so that really of digging into it and then being able to explain it, I saw that mirrored in my family 
where we can go figure this out. And the same thing with zombies and the same thing with is, okay, you can be scared or don't know or whatever, but we're going to dig down to it and we're going to, you know, kind of explain it, repackage it, talk about it. Right. Cause not, you know, we're at that time, none of us were scientists, you know, I'm the kind of first scientist in my family, you know? Uh, and so that really is what modeled that behavior and being able to talk about it and being able to just chat around the, the TV or the dinner table and that kind of thing. And so ever since then, that was just how I learned to be like, okay, so what we do, we don't know stuff is we go look some stuff up. Right. And trusted. And I love how my parents, again, I didn't know this, but trusted resources, vetted resources, you know, primary literature, secondary, li- going to the librarian. I mean, that was mm-hmm. really a boss move on their part, really getting into it and then distilling it down. And my dad, like, what did you, he would like write, have me little write little reports. I'd write little two page reports. <laughs> wow. I was such a nerd. Still, <laughs> uh, And kind of get into the habit of that. And then, you know, my family, knowing that I was such a nerd and maybe trying to occupy me would, <laughs> would just be like, go write us a, what did you, you know, go look this up. And, and I loved ferreting that out. And then of course, packaging it up into these little bite-sized things. And, you know, when you'd watch these movies, my family loves to know things and we love to show off a bit. Like, did you know so-and-so? So we'd watch these horror movies and we'd be like, oh no, you would just die because that's necrotizing fasciolitis and it does this, you know, or like these little tidbits, Mm -hmm. but, you know, being able to say them in a non-jargony way, first of all, you have to be able to understand them with a certain level of depth to then be able to communicate them succinctly and without sometimes technical language, uh, which can be really hard for, I do love my technical language. (laughs) Uh, so that I think really now, you know, definitely as I've gotten older, I'm like, it was Jaws. The root of it was, <laughs> was, yeah. was a big old shark. <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. Um, when you are writing for a general audience, um, you, you, you have to use shorter sentences, you have to use, you know, shorter words, and it has nothing to do with, with like the, ability of one reader versus another. Yeah. It's the fact that you're used to writing in technical language and uh, in a very precise way, but then you have to write about an unfamiliar topic. So you don't want the complexity of the language to get in the way of like something that's probably pretty complicated, you know, as far as like newspaper columns go, magazine columns go. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to ask, When you're constructing your sentences and your paragraphs to talk about sometimes a fairly obscure scientific process or object, how do you, how do you go about doing it in a clear way? How do you, how do you write so clearly? I actually write like, okay, so if I was, you know, let me tell you this story. It's wild. And then I would proceed to tell it. So my, my style is going to be, I read them back to myself. And I think about if I was at a cocktail party or at some type of, you know, networking thing, and somebody said something, I'm like, oof, that reminds me of this case. Let me tell you about it. It's why, you know, and then you would proceed Mm -hmm. to kind of drop those nuggets. And because again, you have a very short amount of time, not because people maybe aren't interested, but because if you're in a network cocktail, you know, there's things, there's this, the buffet is opening. Uh, (laughs) And so what is the hook to be like, first of all, I want to keep like the storytelling aspect. Um, And that is what got me into that style. And that might, you know, I, my style is, is I always think about re I always read it back to myself. And is this how I would, tell this story if I was trying to like entertain at a cocktail party or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so I fill in the gap that way. Um, And sometimes, you know, and editors might be like, oh, they're going to try to make it more whatever. I'm like, but that's not my style. My style is going to be like, oh, you're not going to believe this. (laughs) Uh, At least that's what what I tried to do. Um, And I also know that from my own is that sometimes the editing and the, and the cuts are really critical. Like what's the, and I'm sure as a teacher too, is what's the core 
student learning objective. What, and that is work that we as teachers or communicators need to, do, to be is what are the key things that are pivotal? Mm-hmm. Um, so what are those key things? And then of course I do want to be like, this is just weird. and It's fun. So I'm going to throw this, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, the little bits um, in there that might kind of keep people, you know, kind of going along. Um, but I do try to, you know, sprinkle in the gems. <laughs> How do you pick your topics? Um, you know, you're doing this on a semi, you know, pretty regular basis, right? And and there's a you need a lot of material that how, how do you come up with your ideas? Sometimes, you know, I I you know, staying up to date in the literature and of course the literature that I read in forensics is, you know, Forensic Science International, Journal of Forensic Science, uh, Egyptian Journal, right? Like certain things and, and again, truth is always stranger than fiction. And that, you know, is, is one thing. And sometimes I write about fictional stuff and go like, well, this is why this is wild, right? <laughs> like, yeah. This is, a, you know, what's this based on kind of thing. Um, and sometimes I also do love just in a weird way. And I've been writing for like trace analysis for a few years now is it's hard. It's weird to say this, but I have like a Christmas column, a Halloween column, or like a winterish holiday column, a Mm -hmm. Valentine's column. And I try to like fit feet, which is again, very odd when you think about, you know, crimes. Um, But I, I do try to do that. Uh, Like last holiday season, it was um, fraudulent rum. I read that one. Yep. (laughs) Who knew what a hotbed of duplicity, (laughs) right? You know, and so that kind of yeah, it doesn't have to be murder, right? (laughs) No, (laughs) more. No, I mean that's the thing is it can be right. It can be fake Gucci, Pucci, rum. Like it can be art. You know, I just, I you know, the art and uh, artifact frauds and authentications is a fascinating area. Um, That's whole one. You know, so there's tons there, and sometimes it's really it's maybe not a crime, but it's just something a little bit shady or (laughs) weird. Sometimes it's just weird. So sneak peek, uh, this, this year's holiday column is just weird. And one of those things that you're like, really, but not, not the criminal or, or, or particularly, I mean, it's sometimes the stories might be unfortunate and I do try that I think that's what I often think about is that how to communicate sometimes on really shocking events. Um, given that I do write about oftentimes what I do in a way that is communicating science, but also these sometimes the things that you're talking about um, do involve fatalities, um, various types of violent or interpersonal crime. And, and even when it's a financial crime or like um, the one I did on wildlife trafficking and, and the kind of really interesting analytical work to match up and kind of, you know, do that stuff, that when you realize that wildlife trafficking rivals arms trafficking, human trafficking and drug trafficking, like they all kind of go together, it is sobering. And I, mm-hmm. I do try to, even though it's conversational in my tone. I do try to, just as you would when you're talking to someone, when you get to kind of difficult subject matter, you tend to kind of take a more serious or you drop a tone or you, you know, you kind of modulate it again and everyone kind of agrees that like, this is a serious bit. And then you kind of go back to an ups, you know, you still are in that moment, respectful and, you know, trying to, to meet the, the gravity of the yeah. situation and a lot of times still, yeah yeah your oh, subjects you know may still be alive uh there i mean right. there, there may be people involved that are still uh still around um that's the I, balance yeah. yeah yeah um so your 
I'm not sure if it was your interest in writing or or film that got you involved as a scientific consultant for Hollywood. <laughs> My and, nerdiness, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And recently, one of your uh, one of your scientific consultant credits is the Amazon movie, The Tomorrow War. Um, which I watched <laughs> and I told my wife that I was watching this as part of my job for homework. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> and, and I thought it was a, I thought it was uh, delightful. And I'm wondering what, uh, well, you know, in, in its way. And I wonder what, at what stage did the producers ask you to comment on? Like, first of all, how did you get the gig? So I uh, do uh, work with and volunteer with the National Academy Science Entertainment Exchange. And so this is kind of an entity that really does help connect artists with scientists in a variety of disciplines and screenwriters, producers, I mean, all, I mean, all kinds that, that request assistance. And then they match the person up with someone on the books that might have relevant expertise in this area. Uh, and so, you know, I've done, I've, I've done, um, all kinds, you know, books, um, just chime in a couple cents or a screenwriting. And this one, uh, this was a producer that, that reached out. I'm not sure how much I can say it, but I, I mean, <laughs> nobody's told me not to say, it, but I, I, you know, at, at the time, and this was, you know, when I, when I consulted for them, this was pre-production. Mm -hmm. So this was, this was quite early, um, I think, you know, the exciting thing is I, I definitely have become a better consultant because, you know, my job is not to be like a, a dream killer, right? <laughs> like yeah. that's not going to work, <laughs> you know, is to, is to say, well, you know, here's, here's some things. And, and of course, like really it's all probable, you know, probably is like the number of things that would have to go right or wrong for this, you know, to occur. But, um, so in that movie, you know, and, and there's another technical consultant, I know that we both I'm pretty sure that we both were like, oh, you can absolutely do isotopic abundance and be able to date to major geological events like Karakatoa. I know I shared that. Um, you would need, and I remember saying specifically, you really want to a volcanologist, uh, which I just think is a cool sounding job and it is a cool job. And it was the uh, kid in the classroom. And I it love was that the twist. Kid, right. <laughs> and, you know, these things that you, and, and again, we do that we do that kind of dating and that, and not only dating, but where in the world we have such detailed data that we can like pinpoint it, you know, down to state, to region, to sometimes down to GPS, especially with food stuffs that are really high economic yield or just certain areas for atomic data. So that kind of detail and just not only that, but just certain things about instrumentation and, and robotics and, and so it's, it's kind of fun to see, you know, what, what they did with it within the story. Um, and then again, you got, I think it's great that you just got the term out with a movie that seems to have done really well, that people are going to Google volcanologists mm -hmm. and they're going to hear about certain types of analysis and, and how you can locate it. Like, that's really exciting to me that, that, you know, that, that, that got in um, and it's fun work. Uh, to do that. Oh, I, I can imagine. And I won't put you or the other scientific consultant on the hook for the fact that they call the Falcon tubes um, ampules. <laughs> First of all, why were they always looking at, okay, yes. And I was like, I'm not sure what the microscope is for. And they keep, they keep looking at the slides, but yet reading the instrument and the match. And I was just like, but there's certain things, and I know this from having been on like chemists, you must stare at brightly colored solutions intently at some point in this film, right? I mean, it must occur. They must be behind you, in front of you. You're holding one. It has to happen. And biologists of any stripe. There has to be a microscope. I, I think that's literally the rules. I, yeah, don't I, think, know. I think they're I think they're counting atoms with with an optical at optical wavelengths. <laughs> it was I was like, what's my and it was just a constant. And and I was like, they got it. Well, other than that, like, because, you know, you and I both know it. I'm analytical. I love my crockpot instrument. And I do remember sharing that of like, oh, no, this is all robotic auto sampler, auto fraction collection. Set it and forget it, friends. Like 
this is the great thing. And I, I think I sent them a couple of links to the kinds of instruments, you know, GC, um, mass spec, LCM, I mean, CEs, all kinds of stuff. And I remember thinking like the scene, I guess, which you wouldn't want, like what it would really be is you, you put in the plate in the auto sampler and then you beep, you hit start. And then you're like, all right, now we're just going to sit and stare at each other. Like, that. <laughs> I, I think it was like, no, no, you got to stay busy. This person needs to be looking at slides and you, you can't be <laughs> like, so I, I, you know, that's the part where you're like, oh no, they can't just be standing there. They have to be looking like they're doing science. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> right. Yeah. And I don't I read... know about your science, but much of my science is like sample prep, sample prep, put it in the instrument. Then you just are like, okay, I'm going to go write a report or check my emails or go teach a class. Oh, I and then read... you come back hours later and you're like, here it is. <laughs> right? I read so many books waiting for stuff to pump down. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> heat up and a kneel. Nobody and... wants to film that. Right? <laughs> right. Nobody. I think that's just much like CSI. I used to always joke that half of my time was spent doing paperwork, reports, documentation, whatever. You never saw that on CSI. They were always running, jumping, solving, you know, just, <laughs> and that's like, you know, the CSI paperwork is not going to be the riveting <laughs> series. They're not going to show you reading the latest paper. And you're like, no, this is it. This is what I do. Like, that's like... So from your columns, you can tell that you are uh, very interested in history. And yes. I wonder how your interest in history has worked its way into your classroom teaching. Ooh, you know, context is everything. And definitely, I think that's a big thing in analytical is that what's the context of the analysis? Because that's going to influence how much time, how much money, how much resources, you know, and I think that context really explains quite a bit of what you have available, and what you can work with. And so I definitely think, you know, you need the full story. Like, what are the details? And, and that just expanded out for me to, you know, to fill that in. But I also think, again, it kind of goes back to my family and, and our kind of, you know, movies and things is what else was going on? Like what's the, the zombie movies are great about this because yeah, yeah. Monster, whatever. But the scariest people in the movie usually are not the monsters. It's these trash human beings. <laughs> like someone's going to do something <laughs> wild, you know, it's these other, so it's the, it's the context. And also when was it made and what was going on at that time? Because is that going to explain like what, again, what they have at their disposal, why aren't they doing this or why did they do that? Or why wasn't this available and why? And I think it definitely comes up. I, I teach an intro kind of an intro to forensic science and you, you have to say, well, you know, what's again, the context to this whole thing, because it does not so much, I don't know, sometimes it can't explain what, <laughs> you know, it's mm -hmm. beyond, but it provides the context to say, okay, here's, here's where we're at. Um, and here's what else was going on. But also I, I'm thinking about one of the things I wrote about was um, uh, alleged poisonings potentially in the Medici court. Um, but also just what else? And there was another that potentially arsenic, but then there was another case in the Victorian England, which also potentially involved arsenic. But then at that time there were in, in Victorian England, there's things called arsenic eaters where they would just kind of chronically poison themselves. They didn't call it, you know, to kind of, they thought they were medicinal or clinical, you know, and that's kind of been thought to be the case for a long time. So if you didn't look at the greater societal context of, in one case, well, what's the baseline arsenic level in that area? Is there a well water issue? Uh, what tests are available? What was going on in the Medici court where everyone thought, oh, it was totally poison, right? <laughs> like, yeah. and then moving forward into the Victoria is, so you have to know about, oh, so he could have been ingesting this the entire time and it wasn't the spouse. Like, like that part is really key when you get to the forensic work is, is the entire the, the backstory. And mm -hmm. that really has, has shown up again and again. And so, you know, you always kind of sneak, especially you're not so much sneaking in forensics. You just have to kind of, you know, here's where we are. 
and what else kind of, you know, is, is going on. It's really going to inform things. And then of course, you know, in chemistry, um, it, you know, we do kind of sometimes, right. Get the history in on, you know, what was going on at this time and what we thought when, um, when we're teaching certain concepts. And so I, I do try to, to get that in, um, because again, I think the backstory helps inform why did we go in this direction? Um, and why didn't we go in other directions that we did in five years or 10 years later? Uh, mm-hmm. And I think that that is, I think it's also storytelling. You know, sometimes it's those other details and sometimes people call it filler, but that's really what sets up in relief and fills out the story that hooks people. It's some of this quote filler detail yeah, that sets the stage, absolutely. the window dressing, if you will. Mm-hmm. So in your, uh, in your research, you emphasize the uh, portability of analytical devices. Um, is it fair to say, like, I don't want to, I don't want to ask questions that are like only kind of a garden path of your research, but like, (laughs) so, so it's, it's fair to say that like the cell phone, laptop, portable equipment using sensor types that we already have available. That's like a a pretty significant part of your work. Mm -hmm. What capabilities do you wish mobile devices had that they do not have that would make your work uh, easier? You know, it's uh, because the cameras are quite good and, you know, we're able to write software, whether, you know, apps, people are able to write their own. I, I've certainly participated in that or to log into networks that can run, which is much easier to do than to try to, you know, get into an Android platform and iOS um, to do that. Uh, I think it's, it's going to be weird, but I do a lot of digital image calorimetry or DIC, which lots of people are doing, you know, I mean, it's really kind of fun stuff. Uh, but the challenge is you got to have a good image. And what I mean by that, and and it's not the image quality because now, right, it's mind blowing. People are shooting movies on iPhones. I mean, that if you set, if you change the settings and all of that, I mean, you can do some top notch things, but you have to control for lighting. You still have to calibrate all of those bells and whistles or accessories. So really not the cell phone angle. It's more of, but you still need a quality image. And I'm mm-hmm. sure that anybody, right, that does imaging with microscopy um, or, or environmental application, we all, there's a whole collection of us in this one project. I'm involved in very different research areas, but it comes down to the uniformity of an image, right, that you have to capture with, because you know the influence of lighting and perception, and you can see that in art. You can certainly see that, right, if the lighting conditions and the staging of microscopy isn't just right. Right. And the same thing goes in, in my work, but definitely now, like the cell phones, like are just astounding the image, image quality, but it's the image capture in those conditions, which again, Mm. is not so much the phones part. It's all of, we have to control like environmental conditions to do it. Do you need standards like a, like litmus paper, like in the pool dipsticks where you have the different Well, we use a lot of the same things that graphic artists do to calibrate, like your monitors, like Pantone color sheets. So you can buy calibration for imaging, for your cameras and and imaging devices. And we use a lot of the same. And that's the, that's the fun part for me. I don't think of it as like, darn, someone's done it before. I think, yes. (laughs) And so, you know, all of that quantitative, like Graphic artists aren't like, looks kind of tomato red. To, no, man, give it to me in like RGB, HSB, CYMK. Like, let's quantitate this and get it down, right? And then also using, you know, standardized, purchasable. Here's our, you know, color sheet that's calibrated. You know, we're going to calibrate this device with and set it up. And of course, we as scientists, we do love calibration. So that kind of thing, of course, right, normalizes. And of course, it is an additional step. But as an analytical device, always working on, and maybe this doesn't sound to me, I love it, but it doesn't, maybe doesn't sound like, ooh, super exciting. It's like really trying to get that process to be even faster or easier, right, to to do that. But that's also the great thing about 
the democratization of filming and photography through a device that's multi-purpose because what's occurring is that the technology is getting cheaper and better and the the support um, supplies and, and techniques to calibrate and color correct and deal with white balance are also getting cheaper, easy to use, more readily available. You can buy portable photo boxes and this and that for very affordable prices because of this thing and it's benefiting the folks that do quote smartphone science. Mm -hmm. And, and I think it's great. So the arts have really continued to benefit the science uh, and vice versa, I hope. Yeah. And it's amazing that like professional landscape designers, architects will use the measurement tools on their phone. (laughs) I mean, just some of the best apps I've seen for color space analysis are art apps or, you know, again, not, not so much, and, and they, but they've been adapted. There's a great one for visually impaired for titrations, you know, cause some of our indicators are color indicators and that's a great one, you know, like it's just, it's a, it, when I grew up and I would watch like OG Star Trek with my dad and, and wish I had a tricorder, we have one, <laughs> you know, and that is just like, <laughs> Yeah. And there is, there is, um, (laughs) speaking of OG Star Trek, um, a few years ago, I don't even know where this is going to go, but I feel like you'd be interested in this. I love it. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So they remastered in 4k, the original Star Trek, and it was like relatively (laughs) Like they had the old 35 millimeter prints and they redigitized them. They <gasps> like redid the effects. And that version is on Netflix. Then I a few years later, mm. they did uh, they did the next generation. And they had to make a choice there because the the um the motion cap uh, space shots, the um, animations that were added for like phaser blasts and explosions yeah. and stuff, they were not on the 35 millimeter print. They were added after an NTSC standard for 480, like yeah. I or 480P. So when they remastered them, they had to go back and draw in <gasps> all of those effects digitally because the originals would look like junk on top of a 4k master and it costs so much work it costs 12 million dollars to do that and the reason why basically deep space nine and voyager will never be remastered in 4k (laughs) is because of the enormous amount number of special effects shots that need to be redone in cg in order to render in 4k on the 35 millimeter (laughs) master and we're talking like (laughs) we're talking like I don't know, something like a hundred million dollars to do <gasps> both, of, both of those shows. <laughs> like Rich, multiple. by the way, is like one Marvel movie. Yeah, I'm just kidding. I, I, isn't yeah, it? I mean, I you're, you're absolutely right. And like, <laughs> you know, uh, my Deep Space Nine was my favorite TV show of all time. Cisco was my favorite captain. Um, uh, Kira was my favorite first officer. <laughs> and that, you know, you know, that Deep Space Nine is such... And I watch it again. I mean, I grew up watching Next Generation. Don't, you know, but Mm -hmm. something about Deep Space Nine, it has the, my appreciation for it has grown. Um, And and not that the other ones, but that one, I'm just like, man, I really slept on that when it came out and then rewatching it. I'm like, brilliant. Right. Like, and, and it's, you know, some of the, you know, some shows you're like, Ooh, I'm sure we should, you know, and then other ones you're like, still true, you yeah. know, still, still speaks. And, and I think Star Trek overall, which is why like just the fan base of it, you know, and the expanded universe of the books and all of these things. But yeah, it's, uh, I have a special place too in my heart for Deep Space Nine. So I'm glad that you brought that's, this up. That's fantastic. <laughs> uh, and, and also like Iris Steven Burr, the uh, executive producer, um, 
you know, they, if the show was a little bit more popular, I don't know how you, how you feel about this, but if the show had a little bit bigger viewership, they probably would have gotten a little bit more credit for like having a black first family in, in yeah. like, as the, the, the title roles, like, um, uh, uh, Captain Cisco and Jake and, um, and they didn't shy away from it either. Like they had opportunities nope. to like explore racial justice in a few episodes. And it wasn't just like, you could have given that role to like a white guy and it would have played exactly the same. It, no. you know, it, yeah. it, it, it wouldn't have. Um, I think one of my favorite, I don't know if you know, Dr. Chandra Prescott Weinstein, she, she, she's a huge Trekkie, but she wrote this really interesting blog post about you know, forgiveness versus like reconciliation. And it was about this, you know, when they talk about war criminals and they meet at this certain case and, and, and how do you, you know, that these bigger concepts, right. Of restorative justice. And we think about when this came out and kind of what we're reconciling with, you know, what, you know, the last couple of years have been, it really does. I just, you just think about these things in this context. And that's the other reason why I love, and, and I think, sci-fi and horror and my family does too is and and Roddenberry said this it sci-fi and I'm definitely not remembering this verbatim but it you you get rid of the junk and you focus on what's important and Mm -hmm. and I think that you see that over and over again when I think also about deep space nine and gender identity and gender fluidity and different partnerships and just and of course across the entire Star Trek expanded universe, and some of the concepts that you talk about were really tackled there first in a yeah. in a lot of ways and continue to be really at you know pushing the, the pushing boundaries. Um, and that part is really fun, not only of the science, but of scientists and the people existing in this world, um, which is you know just an exciting. You know, great. Now I want to go and binge watch all of yeah. this. <laughs> and, and, and you can you can slip it in and it's like, you know, kind of like a subversive effect on the national consciousness because it's in yes. this this sci-fi yes. fantasy universe. You can have Kirk and Uhura kind of kiss in that, in that right. COS episode. Uh, and then you can have Dax and her former um, female uh, partner, uh, kiss on Deep Space Nine, and that was the first mm-hmm. time that that happened. Um, I I believe, um, yeah, and and it provides like like cover against criticism, I guess, but but in in like in a like in an intentional way, like yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let's talk about teaching for a few minutes. Um, okay, how how can um we hear a lot about inclusive teaching and trying to introduce uh, compassion for student uh, students students and student success, trying to get them to feel like more than just a number. And I wonder um, how inclusive teaching practices can enhance a STEM course. It kind of makes sense, like in a in a history course in a literature course, you can talk about context. You mentioned some of the ways that in in a science class that's that's also possible, um, but it seems like it's harder to do inclusive teaching in STEM. Am am I wrong about that? I I want to be well, wrong I, about it. I, but I think it is where where we as educators should start. Why do we think that? Why is it that science somehow we treat it even though it's a it's a body of knowledge that's assembled by people through research done by people, why we think that that's somehow very different than history and literature, which is also done by people over time and space. Like, like, um, and and we know, right. That, you know, history like has not always been quite right. As I would say, you know, science and there needs to be corrections and revisions um, as well as science. And I think that, you know, why we should be having these conversations. Why do we think that this is different? Where does that come from? And is it just, you know, in some ways, is it a part of the PR um, and, and really getting into that? Because, you know, 
when you think about, especially in certain introductory concepts where the classes might be quite large, you know, I'm thinking general chemistry, when you're talking about you're, you're teaching atomic structure and all of these things, and you often, right, you often talk about, you know, say Millikan, which Caltech is kind of reconciling, you know, with that role. And you think about mathematics or in forensics, you might talk about Galton, and you really have to talk about some other things about that. So why wouldn't we then be able to say like, so yeah, so about that journal of eugenics, right? And, and, and these other things, like why, have, why do we continue to buy into the idea that science is devoid of that when we know that that, that is not the case? And there have been very high profile for years now, for many, many years, that there, again, you can have you know, poor sampling and then get to a part where you have a data set that you're like, wow, that is, yeah, you know? And so part of that is maybe we have to really have some honest conversations about why do we think that? Um, and, I, and I'm not saying I have all the answers, but I've definitely gotten more critical about that, 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 that viewpoint, that, that hill, and, and really ask myself, okay, but is, you know, is that really where we're going. But I, I mean, so that's the subject matter. We really need to dig into that. Now, what's different is also how we have certain classroom policies or which I think during this pandemic, right, we've all had to kind of flexible teaching and scheduling and certain other alternative testing practices just because of where we are and dealing with, you know, accessibility issues and all of these things because we were forced to. It's unfortunate that we were <laughs> Some of us didn't really get on board with some of these things un until we, we really did have to. Um, but those are practices. So I think, and, and, and I don't want to just make it a simple binary because I think there's a lot of in between, but I do think there are content and kind of feel things. And then I do think there are practices and policies and guidelines about, you know, which types of assessments um, are we having kind of lecture style? Are we in groups? And, and how are we checking in with the groups and how are we managing that? Like, so I think it's that whole gamut. And nice. I think that you can have, um, and really kind of seeing in the literature, like I saw a great paper, there was a whole theme in a journal. I'm, I'm blanking on which one, sorry, but anti-blackness in math blew my mind. You know, like just these subtle ways we communicate with how math is taught in this country, in certain places and not others, which then gets us to the deeper issue of how schools are funded. And I mean, really down the, the, the rabbit hole, but then also at the, that does influence, right? Math, a thing mm -hmm. that I think many scientists would be like, but what's math is like, we just think of it as, but it's just a number, right? <laughs> how does that have like a whole, but it's, again, it's the practice. It's what people are exposed to you know, which level of genius they're exposed to and how we even use that turn of a phrase and who we, you know, which work we're presenting in the classroom, which, you know, which papers we're choosing, which authors we're selecting from which parts of the world, all mm -hmm. of these practices in addition to teaching styles and again, types of assessments and thinking, okay, how can I mix this up? And really thinking, it, it, like a scientist and being like, is my, and it's not a direct parallel, but when I think about for analytically, when I think about sampling and how we're really, we really, you know, methodology and really digging into that of how am I setting this up and how is that setting me up for bias and, and implicit X, like really getting into the meat of that, then just turning the same energy <laughs> into our teaching. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's not something I'm trained to do. I don't know about you, but I have a PhD in chemistry, not education. <laughs> and that's yeah. not an excuse, but I will say that some of these concepts I've learned from professional development, and, and I'm not sure at your institution, at my institution, we have the center of, of research, teaching and learning, right. And, and going to get additional professional development and really digging into pedagogy and praxis and curriculum and some of these practices that again, that's, it's not actually uh, from kind of 
our our birthplace or our kind yeah, of growth sure. as scientists, right? It's not our milieu, right? We have to assemble that later. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, the good news is, is that we have colleagues where this is their whole jam. <laughs> they can just yeah. wax eloquent on it. And I benefit like you maybe from just being around that expertise of of teaching, uh, of curriculum design, of educational psychology, where you're just, you know, you go even an hour listening to um, a teaching expert, just, it's just, I didn't even think about that. Now I want to go back and look at this chemistry curriculum and think, what is this small change? You know, like for me, I really, I redid years ago, redid points distribution so that, you know, exams are, um, they're just not the, they're not deal breakers because mm-hmm. it's performance at that point, not competency. Yeah. At least that's, you know, kind of where I've come to where let me, let me distribute the points to really recognize the, the, the grind of learning. I hate mm-hmm. to call it a grind, but some days it is a grind, yeah. but you know, that thing, but then, and I've had this conversation with students where I know you're competent because I'm talking to you and I can tell the performance of competency which can be altered by stress, by, you know, anxiety. I've done it. You, maybe you've done it where you're just like, that wasn't my best performance, but it's like the one you get Mm -hmm. and it's high stakes. And so, but it it doesn't mean that you're not competent. Unfortunately, our, our opportunities to perform competence in a, in a classroom are very limited, which is different than in our research life where Monday, research went eh. <laughs> Tuesday, I showed up and I rocked it. Right. Like it's, it's yeah. a very different, and in our professional life, we get lots of opportunities to perform competence way more than in kind of your conventional classroom, but how can right. we shift that? So educators have those conversations and, and, and trying to come up with best practices. And I try to talk to colleagues and get their input. And like, I did a peer observation and people looking at materials and giving feedback, experimenting with best practices, looking at the literature and seeing the results, right. Of trying to do those things. So I try, I'm trying to approach the practice of teaching and, and mentoring the same way that I do my analytical work. Some days are better than others, <laughs> but that, but that's what I'm trying to do. I love that. And I, I love that, uh, that idea of separating competency and performance. It's like taking, uh, I don't know, pick, pick, pick your sport, like soccer or bowling or horseshoes. It's like you're, you miss the goal some percentage of the time. And like, do you watch Premier that's your football? midterm score. Um, no, but <laughs> well, you know, a penalty kick like in a, in an important match. And, and there was, you know, you get that one shot and with screaming fan, you know, or, or X factor, which I thought I show I watched, but again, it's one of those things where you might have someone who's really great singing in the shower and they have a voice of an angel, but standing in front of thousands of people in a high pressure environment is a, just a very different thing. We can train for that. We, you know, high stakes kind of thing, but I I do worry. And I've tried to mitigate that and train for that is that that high stakes, you know, you have to train for that. Like we have, we've had years to train for some of those things. Um, But you can see it and you definitely, your example of athlete is great because how many times, you know, the person can make the shot, make the kick, you know, run that thing. But it just, yeah. that time, you know, yeah. for whatever reason. And, and, you know, okay, we're at the, the hour mark. Do you have Ooh. like, <laughs> do you have like three more minutes? Yes, yes, okay. yes. <laughs> um, so like I've recently like tried to get my mental health and anxiety under control, like trying to take it more seriously, but, mm-hmm. and people who don't experience this have no clue, like taking the GRE. Oh, what a nightmare. I, like in the GRE <laughs> math, it's like it, they're not even hard questions, really. But if you had a, you know, a lot of time to do them, but like I, I scored like below the 50th percentile mm-hmm. because like my mental bandwidth was like 
80% of the bandwidth is taken up by adrenaline and cortisol. And I'm going to oh, yeah. ruin my life and everything. And mm -hmm. <laughs> thankfully there were some compensatory factors on my application, but you know, at the time I thought, I thought I was toast. I feel um, the same way. And that's why hearing that and, and also hearing the data and hearing about how the standardized test scores only correlate to affluence and access to certain things. And they're not, you know, they're really hindered by other items. The little sphere I have control over is, okay, yes, we do need to still, uh, you know, these, these things. And there's great alternative grading. I don't know why, you know, it's not, you know, some other schemes where it's really about more of those opportunities, but they're each kind of a little bit lower stakes because this is absolutely a real thing for many people. But again, what am I testing you on then? Mm -hmm. Am I testing you on real competence and like grasp of the material? Or am I testing you on your ability to deal with enormous amount? Like, <laughs> and so I right. agree, like, it's just not a good measure. If again, what I'm trying to get to is, have you made excellent progress in your understanding of chemistry? Not, can you deal with <laughs> someone staring <laughs> at you? You know, that's a different, and I know a lot of people disagree, but that was, that's really one of these questions where that's where it's great to talk to colleagues and go to these things is to say, what are we doing here? And, and what, again, at the core, do we want to accomplish with this? And is there a better way and looking at outcomes? And I also want my, like you, you felt a certain way. And I know I did after taking a GRE, but how do you want the self-efficacy data, and that's a, a real measurable quantity, is that self-efficacy of feeling like I've accomplished something we know promotes you know, retention and it recruits STEM identity, and then you do more in the subject matter and you then learn more. And then you, and it's like, you know, there's a trap mm -hmm. and we have you. But <laughs> so <laughs> that kind of day, again, got that from my education homies. And that's where, isn't that where we want to get to where there's, this isn't pie. There's plenty, of, there's plenty to go around and you want just, there's enough for everybody. And I want students, I, I don't want students to feel, especially now that I'm just a smarter and better teacher. I want students to feel like I made some progress and I feel good about it. Mm -hmm. And, and I want them to get to that point. I know I don't say a grade here and that's hard. That's taken a long time to get. It takes a long time to maybe separate out success from a grade because that's just the system kind of we're all in. Yeah. But I want them to feel good about, you know, I, I did the best that I could do and, yeah. it, and, it, and, and I made some real progress. I know more today than I did three months ago. And yeah. Maybe we should grade the derivative, you know, grade the, the rate of improvement instead of I the absolute love yeah. this. Cause then I'm already, I love great. Like, Ooh, I can see the graphs and charts. <laughs> and, and then also we can teach students how, depending on which class it is, everybody we're doing derivatives. <laughs> Final question, your uh, Twitter handle, Dr. Rubidium, uh, why not Dr. Cesium or potassium or another one of the alkali metals? Well, you know, honestly, chemists, you know how biologists sometimes will spell out their name or initials using the abbreviations for amino acids? Chemists do the same thing. <laughs> Rachel Burks. Well, <laughs> and I, my initials are on the periodic table. Woo -woo! Don't I feel <laughs> very deficient at this moment no. for not getting it? No, don't, 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 don't. Yeah. And people who've known me for years are like, that's it. Even that, <laughs> that's it. There's no other secret story there. I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah. You know how us chemists are. We just want to be able to spell things from the periodic symbol. Yeah, I've got deuterium lithium, I think. That's the best I can do. Eh, sorry, friend. <laughs> <laughs> That's not even a compound. Oh, actually, lithium hydride. Maybe. <laughs> 
maybe you can buy some lithium hydride somewhere. It's <laughs> some aluminum li lithium aluminum hydride. <laughs> Maybe, uh, you know, anyway. we all can't be on the periodic table. For yeah, no. <laughs> true. I know. I know you win. <laughs> okay, Rachel, thank you so much for, uh, for chatting with our audience. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't remind my UCSD folks that, uh, that the teaching and learning commons is where you can find many of the resources that Dr. Burks mentioned. And uh, Rachel, thank you again very much for, uh, for joining me today. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to Ideas in STEM Ed, a production of the Idea Engineering Student Center in the Jacobs School of Engineering at UC San Diego. This episode was edited and engineered by Sky Lee with theme music written and performed by John Viviani. Title art was created by Caitlin Wong. Special thanks to Sarah Eckerd for guest booking and marketing. The Idea Center works to promote community, success, and inclusion at all levels. To reach us for guest suggestions and other feedback, please send an email to ideadirector at eng.ucsd.edu. And to learn more about our programs, visit jacobschool.ucsd.edu front slash idea. As a final note, the views expressed by me or the guests do not necessarily reflect those of the Idea Center, the Jacobs School of Engineering, or UC San Diego. See you next time.